Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Patent Literacy Symposium and this session, The Writing Rope, a frame Framework for Evidence-Based Writing Instruction. My name is Nicole Kopko, and I am joined by my colleague, Dr. Pam Kastner, who is our state lead for literacy. We are excited to facilitate this session for everyone. Before we start, we have a few housekeeping items for review. You can access the presenter materials for this session, the presenter bios, and the conference schedule on the patent website, and the link is provided, will be provided in the chat. Just as a reminder, this session will be recorded and is 75 minutes in length, which includes a 15 minute question and answer period. To access closed captioning, click on the icon CC Live Transcript on the Zoom control panel. If you experience techno technology difficulties, please go to the technical support guides area above the schedule on the symposium page. <clears throat> Sorry, <laughs> fumbling with my papers. We would love for you to tweet out or share on out on social media all your learning from the Literacy Symposium. The hashtag for the symposium is hashtag PatentLit 2022. And now we would like to introduce you to Joan Sedita. Joan? Hello, welcome everybody. And thank you so much to Quitan for giving me this opportunity to uh, share with you some thoughts and ideas around a topic that uh, is very exciting to me and that is writing. Uh, I'm going to switch off right now and actually start to share my PowerPoint so you can follow along. And there we go. And please don't uh, forget that there is a handout packet for this. So if you have not accessed that already, it would be great if you did. The handout packet has got um, some pages in the beginning with texts that are from the, the slides and some of what I want to comment on. And then the back end has actual copy of the various PowerPoints. So um, please do that. And if you are, if you have that in front of you now on the very front cover page, uh, I've got some links there to a whole bunch of related um, free webinars and resources connected to writing instruction. So please take advantage of hooking into those. Um, one of them is uh, a link to the International Dyslexia Association, their page where they have graphics, infographics. Um, they uh, basically took this, the concept of the writing rope and the original graphic that I drew for this and um, that's now listed on their, on their website. So our title today is The Writing Rope, a framework for evidence-based writing instruction. And oh, there we go. And let's use this visual, which is going to center us through this whole, um, this whole workshop. Uh, let me give you just a little background about the writing rope and um, why I thought it was worth putting something like this together. I have always felt that when it comes to reading, um, everybody, when you say, what are the components of reading, right? And if you hold up your hand, you know, everybody pretty much can tell you, um, and these components were really emphasized in the National Reading Panel back in 2000, right? But we've got phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, comprehension, right? Everybody can kind of say what those are and that they're discrete, but then they all come together. Um, and many people think about those components uh, as it relates to Hollis Scarborough's reading rope. Um, I felt that with writing, especially since the last, in the last two decades, let's say, since the National Reading Panel came out, I love the focus on reading, right, and the importance of having extended blocks to teach reading. But I think what's happened as a result of that is writing got sort of set to the side. Now, you know, we do have in the Common Core state standards and a lot of other state similar standards, uh, there is a focus on writing, which is great. But I continue to find when I'm out there training teachers that if I say, so what are the basic components? If you were putting together a writing curriculum, or if you were gonna bring in a writing program and you wanted to make sure it covered everything, uh, and there just wasn't anything like that. So that's the basis for the writing rope. 
as you can see, um, it has five major strands. And what we're gonna do in this workshop is gradually work our way through those strands. I'm gonna try to hit like the mountaintops uh, uh, related to each one of these. So uh, let's begin though, by setting the stage with research. What do we know about effective writing instruction? And in this case, for grades four to 12. There are several meta-analyses research reports that have come out in the last uh, 15 years or so. They are on the top of your page two in your handout packet if you wanna actually go and Google and pull these, pull these reports up. Um, basically writing to read, then came writing next, then two IES reports, teaching secondary students and teaching elementary students. Um, let's just hit the mountaintops because I want folks to keep in mind that uh, we wanna make sure whatever instructional practices we use for the teaching of writing, that they are based in research. Now, we're always learning something new, but I think we wanna make sure we keep these things in mind. So let's unpack the IES report for the elementary grades and what were their final conclusions? One, we must provide daily time for students to write. If we want them to get fluent, we gotta give them time and they gotta practice. The second, teach students to use a, the writing process for a variety of purposes. And the writing process, the stages in that, you're gonna find them in the first part of the writing row. Um, teach students to become fluent with handwriting, spelling, sentence construction, typing, word processing. Aside from sentence, everything else in this bullet is really falls under what I call, and many people call transcription skills. So we're gonna hit those. That, that has its own uh, strand in the rope as well. And then finally, creating an engaged community of writers. And, and what does that mean, especially for young children? If you think about it, writing is a way that we communicate and we need to connect to others. And there's a lot of research that supports the, uh, the use of collaborative shared uh, situations and activities where students at every stage of the writing process, beginning with you know, their pre-planning and their thinking about what they're gonna write, then draft writing, and then certainly on the revision stage. So there's a really powerful role that collaborative work can play. Uh, there's a few other things that fall under engaged community of writers. For really young ones, this is where the teacher becomes a writer in front of the students. It's where the teacher does shared writing tasks. So teacher might have on a, on a blackboard or whiteboard or a chart paper, a, working through the stages in a very explicit way and having students contribute to that. So those are the overall findings from the elementary IERS report. The secondary one um, had three major recommendations. The first, to explicitly teach the appropriate writing strategies using a model practice re reflect, which to me means IWU um, cycle in order to teach writing strategies. Uh, look, let's, let's think about it this way. You know, a lot of folks tended to believe that reading came naturally to kids, but we know that that's not the case. We need to give explicit instruction across all components. And I think the same thing happens with writing. There are some folks who believe that it, it will come naturally as long as children can write about what they feel comfortable with. But I think we know from the research that writing needs just as much explicit systematic instruction as reading does. Um, number two is integrate writing and reading to emphasize key writing features. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute when we look at the writing to read report. And then finally, using assessments of students' writing to inform your instructional decisions. So, you know, you may have high school students who are struggling with writing, but if you look closely at, at, at their writing pieces, you begin to realize, oh my gosh, the breakdown is right on the sentence level. Or no, sentences are pretty good, the breakdown is on the paragraph level. So we want to make sure that, especially for our tier two and three supplemental intervention work, that we're targeting the specific needs of the students. Um, the writing next findings. This uh, basically was a meta-analysis of all the research that had to do with how do we improve writing of children in grades four and up. What the authors did for this is they um, identified not only the items, but they put them in order of most effective on down. A uh, little bit tomorrow, let's see, on Thursday, I'm gonna be doing a workshop about 
writing, teaching, summarizing. And I want you to look at how high up on that list that is. Also look at writing strategies, one of the most impactful things that we can do. Uh, and I'm gonna share a few examples of strategies as we hit the rest of the mountaintops. There's that collaborative writing that I mentioned, right? Um, and then I want you to look at the bottom of that first column and see sentence combining. Sentence combining is something that helps students from kindergarten all the way to, to uh, 12th grade and into college. So sentence combining, really powerful tool. All right, and then finally, the writing to read meta-analysis took a look at what we knew from the research about when students write re in relationship to what they are reading, what's the results? And it turns out that when we have students write about the text they read, and that can include personal reactions to narrative text, the kind of thing maybe where you journal back and forth with a teacher or a peer about what you're feeling and thinking about the narrative text. It definitely includes summaries. It includes note-taking. A lot of times folks don't see notes as, as a writing task, but it is just because it's not complete sentences. And it's very powerful in helping kids remember what they're learning. And then finally, when students answer or create questions about text in writing. All of these things uh, require us to teach students the very specific skills and strategies, right, that go into making those texts. But the point is when we do it, it in an unbelievable way supports reading. It supports reading even at the decoding level, but certainly at the comprehension level. So those are, that's the review. Um, I'm gonna share this slide. Most, folk, most of you folks have heard some version of this. Uh, I love that over the last decade or so, it's, it's turned into the IWU. But all of the skills and strategies and techniques that I'm gonna mention in the, in the writing rope overview, every one of them, students benefit from explicit instruction in those skills, strategies, or techniques that follows the IWU path, where upfront we model, uh, we use model sample models of text to model what a particular writing strategy should look like. Uh, teacher models it in front of students, direct, explicit, using thinking loud. Then we are going to move into the guided practice, and that could be small group, whole group, but certainly collaborative until students independently are able to um, apply a particular writing skill or strategy. Now, if we're going to talk about writing, um, we also need to address the issue of executive function and how any weaknesses in executive function skills can really make writing difficult. I mean, it can make all school work difficult, but I think it is especially important when it comes to writing. So what you're looking at here is a, a visual, a graphic that Berninger and Wynn developed in 2006. Um, Virginia Berninger actually developed this a few years earlier, the beginnings of this. And at that point, she called it the simple view of writing. But beginning around 2006, and my guess is with an eye towards how complex really writing can be, uh, she began calling it the not so simple view of writing. Regardless of how you describe it, uh, the term you use, let's just unpack it a little. So if you look at this top box, text generation, that's a lot of what's in the writing rope that we're going to talk about. So all those skills and strategies that students need to have at the word level, the sentence level, broader text, writing, composing, that's this box, okay? Down on the left, you see transcription. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but that basically is your spelling or handwriting and keyboarding. And that the, these two parts of this visual are what generally we think about when we teach about teaching writing. But Berninger reminded us that executive functions, especially working memory, play an important role in this. Um, and you know that includes things like uh, attention, goal setting, planning, right, uh, revising, um, self-regulating, things like that. Now, um, let's also take a look at this quote. This is from uh, 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 Steve Graham and Karen Harris, uh, those, that pair, their husband and wife, they have done so much research. Um, you're gonna see in particular Steve Graham's name on so many of the, um, of the groups of, of research uh, consultants and specialists around writing in those reports. But uh, a lot of their work in the last two decades 
since Berninger was doing, doing that, that model, um, has been around the really important role that self-regulation plays in this. So I love this quote because it really summarizes how difficult writing can be. Um, I'll read it quickly, you can follow along. While negotiating the rules and mechanics for writing, the writer must maintain focus on factors such as organization, form and features, purposes and goals, audience needs and perspectives, and evaluation of the communication between author and reader. I mean, just thinking about all those things that we have to do when we, when we write it, it's amazing to me that, that anybody ever writes anything, right? Um, and self-regulation of the writing process is critical. The writer must be goal-oriented, resourceful, and reflective. For skilled authors, writing is a flexible, goal-oriented activity, scaffold by a rich source of cognitive processes and strategies, text production and revision. So as we begin to move forward and unpack some of those skills and strategies that fall under text generation as well as transcription, always keep in mind that role that executive function plays. And many of the, the um, scaffolds that can be brought in to support writing, uh, such as pre-planning graphic organizers, right, or two column format for taking notes, those are, no, those are the kinds of scaffolds um, that help those students who have difficulties with executive function. Um, what I'd like to do on this slide is just briefly summarize what we know can happen uh, with students who are having difficulty. And I'd like you, while I go through these, I want you to be thinking about what other issues do you see coming up in the writing of your students who have difficulty. Um, first off, one of the things that you'll almost always find is if they're having difficulty with reading, sorry, with writing, they will almost always have problems with critical reading skills. And this becomes really important if we're asking students to write from sources, you know, to a prompt, such as the type we get on state assessments, right, where the students have to pull information and evidence from oftentimes more than one source, combine it together. Um, so they often lack those critical reading skills. They tend to lack an understanding of grammar concepts. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this later and why things like sentence combining are so helpful because it develops that awareness of syntactic awareness or awareness of grammar. Uh, third, they often have a, a difficult time editing their own writing or the writing of others. So they don't even know where to begin. Again, tools such as um, peer or self checklists for looking at your piece of writing in pieces to see, did I do this, did I do that? And then um, thinking about what can I do if I did not do that to fix that up. So uh, a lot of times if they're just asked to look at their work and revise it, they don't know where to begin. Um, they typically have a hard time identifying or creating a logical sequence of ideas. And so they sort of just do a brain dump. They just start writing and they skip over the think and plan stages. They don't use any sort of an organizer to make sure their writing is going to be uh, structured. They often lack strong vocabulary. And, and this also can happen with spelling. And so they have great ideas that they want to get out as they compose and they want to share with others, but they can't find the words to say it well, or they don't know how to spell them. And they're afraid that if they spell them wrong, you know, it, that people are, are not going to, people are going to give them a hard time, right? So they often don't have a lot of vocabulary to actually build out their sentences. And then they don't use effective pre-writing strategies. So I hope as I've been going through these, you've maybe identified a few other things that you see with students who are struggling. Okay, with this slide now, we're gonna start our journey through the writing rope. And uh, I'm gonna take one strand at a time and sort of hit some highlights or the mountaintops. Uh, the first two, I'm gonna tackle them together and that's transcription and writing craft. So let's delve into that a little bit more. Um, under transcription, it's primarily spelling or handwriting, keyboarding. For writing craft, this includes word choice that students make. It definitely includes awareness of task, audience, and purpose. And then all the, the various literary devices. And that could be anything from how to use dialogue in a piece of writing to show what your character is thinking, how do you use allegory? How do you maybe bring in a simile or a metaphor? So that's what pretty much writing craft is. While we have this up here, I do wanna make a point. Um, in a lot of my work and in the work with other keys to literacy trainers when we're training 
uh, teachers in schools, I think we need to make a distinction um, that in terms of which of these, these parts of the rope, is it fair, right, or reasonable to ask content teachers, you know, meaning math or science or social studies, especially in middle and high school, which of these is it reasonable to say, you know, you can play a role in teaching kids to use certain writing uh, strategies and skills to develop their writing, but also to access your content more versus those items on the rope that pretty much are the purview of the English arts or English, uh, sorry, English language arts or English teachers or writing teachers. Basically, I think, and hopefully when I get through this workshop and kind of explain these pieces to you, I think the top one, critical thinking, and the third one, text structure, those are the areas that any teacher of any content can weave in and integrate into their instruction. Items such as syntax and developing better sentence writing skills, writing craft, and certainly transcription, that's gonna fall more in the purview of the English teacher or ELA. And in fact, the transcription in the ideal world, students would have sufficient spelling, handwriting or keyboarding at a fluent enough level that you wouldn't need to be teaching it in the upper grades. Unfortunately, we still have some students that need some help with that. All right, so let's drill down a little bit on transcription and writing craft. Um, if handwriting and spelling are not fluent, and require considerable effort, students are not gonna be able to focus on the higher level composing skills. To me, it, it's very similar to what happens with fluency with decoding in reading. If students by the time they're in grade four and up don't have well-developed knowledge of phonics concepts, how to blend, how to segment, and how to basically decode words on the page, if they're not fluent with that, what happens? We know that they end up putting so much energy into that you know, beginning decoding end of things that there's not much energy left for comprehension. And I think it has a parallel when it comes to writing. So we wanna be looking at students who struggle and determining maybe the problem goes all the way back to the handwriting and the spelling. And we need to go in and, and provide some intervention for that. Uh, what do I list under transcription? Obviously handwriting, but uh, keyboarding as they get older, but within, within the, um, the phonics and spelling realm, we're talking about some students that just don't have recall for sound symbol, you know, letter sound correspondences, spelling patterns, um, sight words for and spelling high frequency words, but also things like punctuation and capitalization. On the other side is what I put under composing skills, and that is generating ideas for what you want to write about. Uh, organizing ideas or information that you're pulling from sources if you're writing uh, from a, a prompt around a source. It's choosing the best words, using language to express your ideas and how do you develop your sentences and then combine them into paragraphs. Awareness of task, audience, and purpose, and then integration of comprehension and, when, and writing when you're writing from sources. So both sides here are important. But I believe that a lot of the transcription skills need to be addressed more in a phonics lesson than they do during a composing lesson. Uh, one of the things that I tucked in under this, this uh, piece, writing craft, is awareness of task, audience, and purpose. And if you're aware of this, it's going to, and it should, influence many decisions during your writing process. So depending on the task, the task might require you to write something very short or something long. It might require a certain format, like write a letter to. Um, so we wanna be clear that students get the concept of a task and that they keep that in mind as they're writing. The audience is absolutely essential. Um, and when we give writing tasks to students, the more authentic or real an audience we can have them writing to, the more engaged and motivated they're gonna to be to keep writing. So just very briefly an example, instead of in social studies or history saying, write um, you know, a composition about uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, right? And his strengths and weaknesses as a leader. Well, instead of turning it into a composition, why not say, pretend that Napoleon Bonaparte Bonaparte is writing a letter to the subjects, uh, to his subjects, in which he's going to explain to them why he thinks he's somebody that they should continue to support as a leader. So that difference between 
a real audience and just an audience of the teacher. And then purpose, what is the purpose? Is it to inform, is it to tell a story? That's where the three types of writing come in. So we wanna be teaching kids about task, audience, purpose. There's actually in the Common Core one uh, anchor standard devoted just to this, and that's writing standard number four. Um, okay, so let's try to define a little bit more about writer's craft and what it is. Good writing requires knowledge of writing skills and craft. It's sometimes referred to as writer's moves, right? So what is that? Um, it's also sometimes described as the art of writing, right? So it's anything that a writer does on purpose to make writing look or sound a certain way. It's the time when the writer makes decisions about tone and voice, right? And what words am I gonna choose and keeping aware, um, awareness of audit audience and how I'll organize this based on my audience. So what are some of the elements of craft? I, I kind of highlighted a few of them earlier, but let's delve a little more deeply. This includes things like the writer's voice. And what is that, right? So it's the writer's unique style or emotion or personality that they're going to bring into their writing. It's also called writing from the heart, right? It's how authors use voice to make the reader feel some emotion. Um, if you've ever read a scary story, uh, that's an example where the, the author builds certain things into the writing to make you feel afraid while you're reading the scary story, right? And it's really achieved through choice of language, um, setting, and use of dialogue. So another thing that comes under, under writing craft is narrative point of view. So I'm sure you've often heard of writing in the first person or the second person or the third. Word choice is, is so important here. It's the purposeful use of certain vocabulary and where you place your words, the use of descriptive language. Um, and this is why if students are, are not fluent and don't have a lot of vocabulary to draw from, it's gonna be real hard for them to make these kinds of choices. And then fi finally, teaching students specifically certain literacy devices um, like allegory or flashback or using figurative language. So that's probably the fastest tour you're ever gonna get of what writing craft is. Um, I could do a whole day on that, um, but you can see why, uh, why I'm saying that that sort of falls in the purview of the writing teacher or the English teacher, because it's very specific and unique. Now, one other point I wanna make before we move to the next part of the rope is about the value of what's called mentor models or mentor, mentor text. What this is, is models of good writing, right? So that students can imitate or emulate. We know that all of us learn to write by seeing how others do it. I'll give you a very simple life example. Um, not too long ago, I was in a, a, a car accident and I had to, at the police station, write out a, an accident report, right? And I had never done one before. So what do you think I did? What would you have done? I, I said, can I see a few as an example? Can I see some examples? And once I saw how other people wrote them, I was able to figure out how to write my own. So models of writing are really important. And we don't do it by just saying, oh, here's a great short story, read it and, and figure out what they did, right? Or here's a great article in Time for Kids, so now I want you to write a really great article. You have to get very specific about a writing skill, strategy, or technique that you're using the models for. So you might pick out something that uh, has, is a great example of how transition words are used. And so you use that mentor model, maybe even a second and a third to say, all right, students, let's look at how did they use these transitions? Let's circle them. Now that you see how it's been done by, by published writers, how would you mimic that and do that in your own writing? Or perhaps it's showing students how to state a claim for an argument piece and how you do that right up front in the beginning of your argument, right? But looking at how others do that. So showing mentor models is a very helpful um, approach. And I have put that all under the, um, the writing craft stand of the rope. All right, now let's move to text structure. And there are quite a few things that are tucked in under here. Uh, we're talking about on the broad level, you can see it in that first bullet there, 
the broad structures for the three types of writing, narrative, informational, and opinion or argument. But it also, um, under here, I've put paragraph structure because there are so many students who still don't get what a paragraph is. And then also in here is what's often referred to as patterns of organization. So when you use a description, that's going to look differently than a sequence or than a cause and effect or a compare and a contrast. And then the last piece under here are linking words or transition words and phrases. Those are what we use to help the flow and the organization of our larger structures, but we also use them to signal to the people reading our work, which pattern of organization are we using? So that's text structure. Let's do a few things under this part of the rope. We're gonna begin with the three types of writing. Uh, these are sometimes referred to as genres, and there are certainly multiple subgenres within these. Um, and this is actually an example of a, of a graphic organizer that you can use in your classroom. We've seen it very, very helpful. So basically, there's opinion argument, and what is its purpose? To convince. There's informational. Its purpose is to inform or explain. And then there's narrative, right? And it's overarching purpose is to share a story. Um, oftentimes students get these things confused. And so one of the first things we wanna do when we give a writing assignment is to make it clear which of these will be the focus. And also sometimes a writing piece could be a combination. So if you think of, let's say a, an editorial in a newspaper, it might begin with a narrative format because they're telling you the events in, in something that happened, right? Then it quickly moves into informational where they're giving you facts and details, right? But it might end because it's an editorial with an opinion related to something about the article. So we want students to, to be aware of the three types um, and also start to share examples in mentor text with them of what a good informational piece looks like versus an opinion piece. Um, one of the other things that falls under these three main topics or genres, types of writing. And if you have a chance to go into your state writing standards, um, and certainly if it's a state that uses the Common Core, but many of the states are very similar. What I want you to do is look at writing, uh, writing requirements for writing standard one, two, and three, which are the three types of writing. And when you dig down into the substandards, you're going to see that every one of the three types of writing has requirements from beginning in grade one all the way to high school for introductions, for conclusions, and for how you develop your body. Um, now, oftentimes the introductions for informational or argument pieces are very similar, except Argument also has to have a claim, what you're, what you're proposing. Um, conclusions can be very similar too, but where the big difference is, is under body development. So I'm gonna walk you through a graphic organizer that we developed here at Keys to Literacy, I don't know, about 10 years ago, uh, to help kids visualize and plan how their, their pieces are going to be organized. Um, you can also use it in the reverse. So that if you are reading something, you can use this top-down topic web to capture the big ideas and the sub-ideas that were in the reading that you did. But right now we're gonna focus on this for writing. And we begin with two default uh, beginning um, graphic organizers. The first is used for informational or argument opinion. And it begins with your topic up here. And then the three basic elements that the Common Core expects you to have an intro, body development, conclusion. The next one on the bottom of the slide, that lends itself better for nar narrative writing. You put your title of your writing piece here and you're gonna do beginning, middle and end. Now let's see how this begins to play out. So let's say you're writing an informational piece. This is a generic top-down web. Um, and let's say it's only gonna be maybe four or five paragraphs at the most. So you've got your introduction. Um, at the very least, you have to introduce what you're writing about. You have to say, this is what I'm writing about, right? This is the topic. We have our conclusion, which by and large in informational writing, we wanna restate the topic in different words, but we also wanna provide some sort of closure. It's the middle that I want you to focus on here. 
So let's say it's an informational piece and you were supposed to uh, write about the four causes of the Civil War, or maybe give um, four main ideas about uh, killer whales. So chances are, if you've got four big ideas, each one is gonna lend itself to a paragraph. We know that in paragraph structure, we wanna state through some sort of a topic sentence and then we wanna add supporting details. But we're not gonna write all that on this topic web because this is just designed to help us organize what it is we wanna say. This is a generic one, um, but let me also show you a generic one for maybe a longer piece. Let's say this is going to be an article that might have seven or eight or 10 paragraphs in it. Your body then won't just be the four paragraphs, it might be breaking it into two areas, right? And giving a heading for each. How many of our students don't know how to use headings and yet it's an integral part of uh, showing the reader the structure. So this might be how it would look like if you were doing a longer piece. Usually the best way um, for me to get folks to understand this is to show you some examples. So here's our first example. This is from a classroom. You can see the teacher gave the blank up top, started intro body conclusion, but then the student built the rest of it out. So this was a writing piece about how rocks are formed. You can see the students noted that makes needs to make sure this turns up in the opening introduction. Conclusion decided to provide some closure by saying they're, they're formed in many ways. And then look at how the body is organized. So this student obviously has got three major sections. These could be turned into headings and then um, information about each follows. This is one from a high school history class. The students were asked to uh, write an informational piece about the Axis powers, say a little bit about each one. And you can see how the students using the top down web to plan that. All right, so now let's shift um, and talk about what these top down webs can look like when it comes to opinion or argument writing. Opinion writing is what younger children do. It doesn't start till about after fifth grade that many state standards expect students to shift to argument writing where they have to include a counterclaim and a rebuttal. So let's just focus on this one um, as the basic for an opinion writing in let's say the elementary grades. It's a generic, right? So what do we know about introductions for opinions? Have to state your topic, but you also have to state your opinion or your claim. In our conclusion, we wanna provide closure, but we also wanna restate our claim. The body though gets developed differently than an, an informational piece because the structure of I'm sorry, of opinion writing is stating your claim, then providing reasons that support your claim, and then for each reason, providing detailed evidence that supports the reason. So if you're gonna set up your opinion topic web, basically if you're gonna list the number of reasons, in this case, it's three reasons to support a claim. So let's see a student's example. This is from grade four. The topic was, should there be two recesses a day for kindergarten to grade three? The introduction, you can see, reminder, this needs to go in an opening statement with the claim. We're going to restate the claim and for some closure, urge the principal to take some action. Here you see the three reasons. Reset, resets, re, sorry, research break reduces stress, recess develops social skills, and physical activity activates the brain. So now the student has got the structure for the writing piece. Each one of these can become a paragraph where they add the details. Now, if we are going to be using an argument piece, uh, this represents where you might insert the counterclaim in rebuttal. So same thing, you state your claim, you provide your closer, but here, this piece is gonna have three reasons. The author is going to give those three reasons with evidence, then introduce the counterclaim and then the rebuttal. Now there's no rule in argument writing about the order of these. So the writer could just as easily give one reason, then give the counterclaim and rebuttal, and then end by giving two more reasons. So let's see an example of this from a, a writing task from a classroom where we've done some work. Title, continued funding for the NASA budget. NASA budget. Introduction, they're giving some background information and then stating the claim, in this case, 
Yes, continue with funding. Funding. We've got our conclusion. We're gonna summarize our reasons, but look how the body is built out. So the actual reasons are stated um, for the two reasons. And when the students begin writing this, they're gonna actually put in the evidence sentences. And then the counterclaim is there with a reminder to re provide the rebuttal. So let's uh, spend a few minutes now just looking at how this can play out in narrative text. I mentioned before it's beginning, middle, end. If we look to common core standards for narrative writing, uh, one of the anchor statements says that an introduction or a beginning to a narrative piece should establish a, sorry, establish a situation and introduce a narrator or a character. We want some sort of closure at the end of our story, but how is this body gonna be built out? It's gonna be built out by a series of events. This is very short, this is a short story, only four events. If you wanted to write an entire novel, I think you can begin to see how this strand could be listed under chapter one, then chapter two, chapter three, and so on and so forth. All right, so that was just a few mountaintops and I wanted you to be able to walk away with one tool that you could use to help students plan their larger writing tasks, narrative, informational, or expository. What we're gonna do now is bring it down a little bit here and focus on paragraphs. There are many, many students that enter middle and high school that have really no clue about what a paragraph is. When they write, they just write in a continuous stream or they'll indent every once in a while because they're supposed to, but they don't, they don't know why. So the first thing we have to do is make sure that students know what a paragraph is. Uh, I'm sure some of you have seen some of these representations that basically represent what's taught in the earliest grades, that a paragraph should start with a topic sentence, continue with, they often say three, support or detail sentences, and then a concluding sentence. However, the fact of the matter is, in much of what we read, we don't find a concluding sentence at the end of every paragraph. And if we're writing a multi-paragraph um, piece, we're not gonna put a concluding sentence at the end of every single paragraph. Our whole piece will have an introductory statement, will end with a concluding statement, but our paragraphs don't necessarily have to have that. So what are some activities you can do to help students develop better writing, paragraph writing skills? One of the common problems around paragraphs is that students don't have good underlying main idea skills because ultimately that's what a paragraph is about, right? You can have a multi-paragraph piece about pirates but each paragraph is gonna be something different about pirates. One might be about, you know, where did they hang out in the Caribbean, right? Another one might be a certain type of pirate, buccaneers. So our topic remains the same, but it's time to shift from one paragraph to another, right? Including that indent, when we're changing the main idea about the topic. So here are a few activities that can develop paragraph writing skills teaching kids by having them color code parts of their paragraph, having them identify the topic sentence in mentor text paragraphs. Another task is to insert a sentence that doesn't belong and have them figure it out. That doesn't belong because it's not supporting the main idea. And then finally, giving students a bunch of supporting sentences and having them generate their own topic sentence. So here's just a really quick example of the color coding that I meant mentioned. Um, this is at the I stage, right? The teacher is providing a sample paragraph and showing students how you color coordinate. In this case, your topic sentence is green, your conclusion is red, and the supporting sentences are left yellow. And then here you see this is a student's paragraph where the teacher has asked them to use highlighters to identify which sentences are which. So again, we've got a lot to cover, so I can't get too much more deeply into paragraph structure skills, but I wanted to um, at least give you a few suggestions. All right, let's also now unpack what I meant, mean about organization, patterns of organization, and the transitions that are associated with them. So this visual basically um, identifies the, the five major patterns of organization under each one, We've got its purpose, right? To help kids kind of remember about, about each of those. Um, but we also, let's jump to this slide about transitions. 
one of the things you can add to your chart in another bubble underneath is to pick two or three really commonly used transitions that are used for that particular pattern of, organ of organization. And I'll share a little bit more about that in a minute. So let's, let's identify what we mean by transitions. They are words or phrases. They can even be whole sentences. They're used to link sentence to sentence or a paragraph to paragraph or even section to section in a text. We use them to clarify relationships, to create cohesion, and to link ideas. They are worth their weight in gold, these little words, right? And many students do not have them as part of their lexicon, especially our English language learners. These do not come in uh, easy to them. What you'll find is students that have good language skills, when they're writing their first drafts, they actually include the transitions at that point. But a lot of our students who it does not come naturally to, they're going to have to add transitions when they go to revise their writing. So I've given you and your handout packet, you can see it on page three. This is a list of common transition words and phrases. I will tell you that I've been distributing this to students and teachers since the late 70s. Um, what, what people tell me they love about it is in the left column, we've identified the purpose for certain transitions and then given those transitions on the right. Um, I highly recommend that you make copies of this. Make a copy and put it in plastic sheet protectors that students keep in their notebooks. Create anchor charts on your classroom wall with these transition words. Um, I've also got on this here a visual of a poster that, that we, we sell at Keys to Literacy. I'm not saying buy the poster, you can easily make your own. The idea is that students have something to go to so that when they're writing and they're trying to find a good connecting word, they've got a source. If you teach students in grades three and four, this one might be a little bit overwhelming. At uh, the Keys to Literacy website in the free resources, we have a version of this for lower grades. All right, so let's move on to the syntax part of the rope. This is one of my favorites. Um, what is it? Syntactic awareness um, means you have a sense of the way uh, formal gra gra grammar works, right? Um, now, we develop that sense from the moment we start talking and listening as, as young ones, right? And this is why the more that students, before they come into kindergarten, the more they're exposed to written text through read aloud, this is really helps develop that sense of the rules that govern how words can be positioned within a sentence, right? Um, so under this strand, I include any activities that can be done to develop that syntactic awareness. But I also included under here sentence elaboration because one of the things that happens after fourth grade with struggling writers is when you look at their sentences, they're very short and they're very simple and they often start with the same word. Um, and what we wanna do is break that habit. We wanna teach them how to expand so that they have compound subjects and compound predicates and they create complex sentences. So a lot of the activities um, that, that I'm gonna share with you in a minute are designed to both support sentence elaboration but also build a stronger base of syntactic awareness. Um, Legos, this is a, 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 or building blocks, this is a metaphor that uh, we love to use here at Keys to Literacy. So I want you to think about, and when I'm live, I can actually bring Lego blocks, right? So I want you to think about every one of those tiny blocks is, represents a word. So how do we build a sentence? Maybe our sentence is gonna be five words, so we stack them together. Now the order is really important. So for example, if I say the flat, I have a flat brown desk, I put my adjectives in front of my noun, flat brown. But in romance languages, we put the adjective after. So it would be desk, flat, brown. So the order that we put our words, that's driven by our syntactic knowledge. All right, so now we have a set of cubes. They're struck together and they're, they're a sentence. How do we build a paragraph? Well, we take several of those and we put them all together. We might, you know those Lego blocks that are longer, that have a lot of dots? We could put that at the top of all of our sentences and that represents our, top, our topic sentence, right? What, the intro to what this is about. 
So now we have a paragraph, you can visualize it hopefully. How do we create a multi-paragraph piece? Well, we take two or three paragraphs and we stick them together, right? And that builds our multi-paragraph piece. piece and so on and so forth. You can just keep building out using the words as the Lego blocks and grouping them into reasonable sentences and paragraphs. So a little bit more about sentence with a syntax with really a simpler term is sentence structure. One by one, and we do this when we speak as well as when we write, right? Sentences communicate the ideas that add up to make meaning. Uh, there's often meaning within one sentence as it is, but it's when we combine several together that we're able to get across a, a broader uh, concept that we want folks to see in our reading, on our writing. So what we wanna do is encourage students to think about what makes a sentence strong, right? And there are several things that we can do for this. Let me just jump to this slide. Um, that help develop syntactic awareness. Sentence anagrams or scrambles, sentence elaboration, sentence combining. I mentioned that to you before, how powerful that is. It keeps coming up in the research as being highly effective. Um, and also on a really basic level, teaching students and have them practice the difference between fragments and complete sentences. Now, um, I could spend three whole hours, actually a whole day on just this piece. We do not have the time in a short workshop. So I've given you a URL there. There was a two-part blog post that I did about a year or so ago, sentence structure and then sentence structure part two. So if you want to access lots of details about how you do this, um, you know, go to the blog and it will explain how you do it and give you lots of um, suggestions. But uh, let's jump back to this previous slide. Um, this, is, this is a quote from Bruce Sadler, who I, he has a book that, that focuses on sentence combining and all sorts of activities for developing sentence sense that, um, that I highly recommend. But I like the way he, he captured this, this idea of the many difficulties writers encounter when engaged in the complex act of writing, crafting sentences that accurately convey the intended meaning is particularly challenging. Manipulating sentences and the words and sentences are both effortful and critical. So out of all of those suggestions, the scrambles, the elaboration, I wanna drill down now on sentence combining. It was developed in the 1960s, consistent finding, effective evidence-based method for improving writing skills, and you can use it across. It is much more effective than traditional grammar instruction, such as teaching kids to label parts of speech, right? So how does it work? I'm gonna give you a simple example. So I'd like you right now out loud to yourself, combine that into one sentence, please. Okay, the book and the movie were good. We could say the movie and the book were good. Let's do another simple one. The thirsty girl drank lemonade. We could also say the girl was thirsty, so she drank lemonade. There's no right or wrong, as long as you get all of the ideas into your final sentence. And here's another one. So this is the simplest example of sentence combining. It then moves on and eventually, as students get better at this and into the upper grades, now you make it more challenging by adding more sentences, right? Uh, we don't have time to have you do this right now, but just begin to imagine what would you have to do to take this string of sentences and end up putting it into a sentence that makes sense, right? So that's a little bit about sentence combining. It can be done in any subject. Um, I think sentence combining, if every, let's say I'm a middle school student, I have five major teachers. If every teacher once a week on the board as we're walking into the classroom had a quick sentence combining activity, especially if it was related to something that we were teaching. And the students spent two or three minutes doing that. By the end of the week, you know, I would have done this, uh, I would have been able to do a sentence combining activity five to 10 times. And that's what builds um, sustainability. All right, so now let's, let's move to the critical thinking, which is the last one. And there are a couple things that I've tucked in under here. One of them is the stages of the writing process. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more. And then the other thing that's under here is that whole collection of skills and strategies that students need to generate ideas 
or gather information from sources, then organize them in order to give information or present an argument. And in many cases to write a reply to a prompt on a high stakes uh, assessment. So let's talk a little bit about the stages of the writing process. In your packet, you have a copy of that chart on the right. Uh, several years back, we were trying to come up with an acronym to help students remember the stages in the writing process. And uh, like often happens to be, I'm awake in the middle of the night and I come up with things and that's where this came from. So basically uh, the stages of the writing process, they've been around for a long time. Um, Hayes and Flowers starting back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, started looking at what do all good writers do to try to come up with a process. Um, and it, that model has been added to over the decades. You can see actually that there's a whole writing standard devoted to planning, rising, uh, write, revising and editing. So how does this little model work? Um, the first letter of each word in the title, the process writing routine stands for the four stages in this model of the, the writing process. Think, plan, write, revise. On your handout and on the slide, you can see the sub details that happen under each. And also, let me jump over that for a minute. I also want you to look in your handout at page five <clears throat> because we've also provided for you a set of guiding questions that students might use as they're going through each of these stages. You know, what should they consider when they're at the think stage? How about at the plan stage? Now, let me give you a little caveat about this list of questions. This list is long, so you wouldn't necessarily give students the whole thing. You might just pick out one or two questions from each stage uh, as you introduce the stages of the writing process, but then once they get more under their belt, you can add some more. Um, I also wanted to spend a moment talking about the recursive nature of the writing process. It is dynamic and we are constantly cycling through these things really good writers when they get to the right stage might discover that they didn't think enough and they need to go back and gather information. Or they might, when they're at the revision stage, realize that you know their writing piece isn't very organized so they have to go back up to the planning stage. We want kids to know that we often repeat and revisit the stages. All right, let's end. I'll probably go about five or six minutes into our question and answer piece with this, but let's end with the writing to learn part of this strand in the rope. I shared this earlier from the writing to read report uh, that when we have students write about what they read in any of those formats that you see on the screen, it really improves their comprehension, but it also grows their writing skills. Writing about what we're reading is thinking, right? Even if we do a really quick rate, a five minute brain dump about something, when we are doing that writing, it helps us organize and clarify and solidify our understanding of what it is in the text that we've just learned about, right? It builds relationship and it gets us more engaged. Writing to learn skills, what falls under this? And I often like to, to explain that Writing to learn actually is almost a combination of comprehension skills and strategies melded with writing. They both work hand in hand. So it includes when you've got sources, annotating them. How do you annotate the text to find the exact information or evidence that you need to pull out to put in your piece? It certainly involves gathering that and how do you save them in the notes? So teaching students something like two column notes, which I'm a, a real fan of, that's an example of a comprehension and writing strategy that helps kids get what they need to put in. Then any kind of planning tools, uh, graphic organizers that help you map out what your writing piece is gonna look at like. You also then have to have a set of skills under your belt to be able to take a note, which is often just a word or a phrase, and how do you develop that into an elaborated sentence? And then how do you grab several sentences and put them together into a paragraph? It also means knowing about text structure. How can you use text features like headings and bold print, right? And then finally, revising and editing skills. So there's a lot that falls under this strand of the rope. Um, this is a chart I, I like to share with content teachers when we're, we're doing this training about writing in the content areas. 
So I want you to think about the kinds of tasks that might be given in any subject area. They can fall out into these three main categories. They can be general academic tasks. So we can teach students how to write summaries that they could use with any subject area. Uh, on Thursday, I'm gonna do another workshop for Patan on how do you teach summary writing. Essays, short answer test questions. How do you write a description, right? Those are general academic. We can teach these to students, maybe even in the English or ELA class. Then they can go to other classes and use those skills to, to write essays or summaries or descriptions in their content areas. Way over on the right, these are subject specific or disciplinary specific writing tasks. So in science, it might be, how do you write a lab report or social studies, uh, tasks that involve writing about historical events. Um, ELA, a literary analysis. So those are subject specific. The ones down the middle, I've got these here to remind you about something we said earlier, the value and the importance of authentic audiences, real world tasks. So this is where, whether you're doing subject specific or general academic, academic you assign a certain form that's aligned to real world writing. So a letter or maybe an editorial, or maybe you're gonna create an infographic. Now, the authentic audiences, sometimes they're real and you can actually send them to them. You can send a book review into you know, the, the school newsletter, right? Or you can uh, write an article for the local paper or write a letter, letter to the mayor of your town. They might not all get read, but sometimes they are. And when students get feedback from the people they've written to, it's very powerful. All right, so uh, let's wrap this up with a few final slides about writing from sources. Uh, we want students to be um, deciding, do I use informational or do I use opinion to answer this, right? And there are several kinds of writing from sources tasks. It could be research papers, journal responses, um, lots of things that we write from task. I mentioned this earlier, this is just a visual that quality written responses when you're writing from sources require skills from both comprehension and writing. I'm gonna skip over the summary writing, um, except just a couple of highlights here. This you've got in your handout packet. These are the steps you want students to follow when they are writing a summary. And then um, just a few pointers about writing from a prompt. So if we've got a prompt in front of us, in this case, the students were supposed to read uh, an article about uh, the garbage on this amazing uh, island in the Pacific, right? Uh, and the prompt is telling them to write specifically about the effect or the impact on Henderson Island of garbage and plastic, how microplastics play a role, and then what are some solutions. So if we begin to teach students to use two column notes before they are starting to write, it would look something like this. So we would put our topic across the top and then down the left side, we would put what are the three main ideas that we're writing about, you saw it from the prompt, and then eventually they add details. So with this slide, this is an example from a classroom. They were supposed to write about the way deer protect themselves. You can see the big topics on the left and the details on the right. And here's another one. This was, uh, the students were supposed to write about themes from The Old Man and the Sea. There's the themes on the left, details from the novel. Okay, and last but not least, I'm gonna leave you with something called a writing assignment guide. This is a tool that teachers use to make sure they're planning a writing task in a very explicit way. You use it to plan the task, but then you easily turn it over to the students and then they know what their expectations are. You see uh, a visual here, and there's also a full page of this on page eight, but you're basically setting really clear expectations um, and you're listing who is the audience, who's the purpose, what is the length, what are your directions? Here are some questions that can help guide you as you create a web and then, oops, and then uh, I think I have a few, do I have a few examples in there? No, I don't. So let's just jump back to this. You know, what might be up here is, I want you to write a summary of the chapter we just read, right? Here is where you're gonna put directions, like you must include three transition words. I want you to include these vocabulary terms. This must be um, 
somewhere between two and three paragraphs. This also is where you could give um, supports like here's the transition list, choose words from this, or you can give hyperlinks to electronic files as well as let the students know when they might have a chance to um, collaborate. All right, so with that, I've tried to hit all the mountaintops related to the writing rope. I want you to remember that you can talk about each of these, in, each of these individually the way I've been doing, and you certainly are going to maybe create lesson plans where you drill down on one particular piece, but we always have to keep in my mind that in order to, um, for students to achieve proficient writing, they need to be strong in all of the things down the left side because they all in the end integrate together to uh, form a rope.